Hello, Arashai Kitsune here. So, yeah, the Western Front of World War II. Um, I was actually kind of expired in, in, in inspired to dredge up my admittedly limited knowledge of this era uh, thanks to the Call of Duty streams posted by Captain Sparkles. And in fact, on one of the videos, I posted a brief commentary on the role the Ardennes Forest played in the war. Uh, as I was going through the replies, I kind of ended up chatting with a user by the name of Big Boss and mentioned that I would have liked to include info on some of the other locations that are seen in the game, but thought that it might be pushing it a bit too much for a comment. Anyway, um, you know, he suggested that if I, he or she, um, you know, suggested that if I really wanted to share the info that I should try making a video, so here's that attempt. I mean, you know, it's not information that you couldn't find anywhere else, but I don't know. If somebody walks away having learned something new, then it's worth it. Uh, I do apologize for the audio quality, equipment, and my office space sort of limit my recording capabilities. Uh, anyway, yeah, I uh, hope you enjoy, and we'll go ahead and get right into it. Now, the Ardennes Forest has a rather complicated history in the Second World War. If you're watching this because you read my comment on Sparkles' Call of Duty video, then you know that I briefly talked about the part the Ardennes played in the fall of France via Fall Galeb and the progression to the events at Dunkirk. But for the sake of my rambling uh, here, I kind of want to go into more detail on the events leading up to the battles. Now. We should start with Directive Number 6, which was a plan built upon very realistic assumptions of needing time to build up German forces over a period of several years, and that at the time only limited objectives could be uh, could potentially be obtained. Uh, with this directive in mind, Hitler ordered the conquest of the Low Countries at the shortest possible execution notice to prevent the French from occupying first and threatening the Ruhr region. Now, taking the Low Countries would provide Germany with a basis for successful long-term air and sea campaigns against the United Kingdom. Here's where the problems start. When writing this directive, Hitler assumed that the attacks could be initiated within a period of weeks. However, he had been misinformed as to the state of Germany's forces. The motorized units, on whom a lot of the plan depended, required an estimated three-month recovery period to repair the damage from the Polish campaign, and ammunition stocks were highly depleted. So, the original plan for taking France was created by Franz Halder on October 19th of 1939, in response to refusals of peace from Britain and France on the 10th and 12th, respectively. Halder was the Chief of Staff of the German Army High Command, or OKH, and please, please don't ask me to pronounce the German translations, as the European languages are not my strong suit. Anyway, this would be the first proposal of Fall Galeb, or Case Yellow. Um, this plan was based on a frontal attack, sacrificing an estimated half million troops to attain the limited goal of pushing the Allies back to the Somme River and postponing the main attack on France to 1942. Now, Hitler wasn't too impressed by this plan, as he had thought the Low Countries campaign would be quick and cheap. There is some thought that Halder was actually against Hitler and intentionally proposed the most pessimistic plan to discourage the attack. This wouldn't be the first nor the last time that infighting within Hitler's officers would cause issues. Or betrayal with among Hitler's officers would cause issues. So, this proposal inspired a twofold reaction. The first being that Hitler scheduled the attack for November 12th of 1939, whether ground troops are ready or not. Um, this led to numerous postponements due to critical defects in preparation or weather. Secondly, as Hitler wanted to cut losses, he attempted to make changes to the plan without really knowing where changes could be made. 
This resulted in a split of effort with the main axis in Belgium and a secondary attack further south. Now, on October 29th, a new version of the plan was released, which reflected these southern attacks. Meanwhile, Erich von Manstein, a commander of the German armed forces, was making another plan in cooperation with Heinz, Heinz um, Gurieren, a general noted for his success as a panzer leader in Poland. The plan suggested that panzer divisions would attack through the Ardennes, then establish bridgeheads on the Meuse River and advance to the English Channel. Here, the army could cut off the French and Allied forces in Belgium and Flanders. The plan also included a secondary push um, further south, uh, which would allow the German for forces to push future defensive lines again farther to the south. Now, this plan was originally proposed on October 31st, but it was rejected. In fact, Halder was noted to have said that the plan was entirely without merit. So, um, you know, they were kind of passing these ideas back and forth, trying to refine the plans. Uh, on January 10th of 1940, documents outlining the details of Case Yellow fell into Belgian hands when a German BF-108 uh, was made a forced landing in Belgium. On January 27th, von Manstein was relieved of his post as Chief of Staff of Army Group A and appointed commander of a Army Corps in Prussia. Uh, this move was actually instigated by Halder to remove von Manstein's influence. Uh, on February 2nd, von Manstein's staff brought the plan to Hitler's attention, leading to a meeting on the 17th in Berlin. Now, Hitler was impressed and ordered the plans changed to fit von Manstein's ideas, as they actually offered hope of a cheap victory. And that was actually pretty much the end of von Manstein's involvement. Uh, he and his troops did play a minor role in France, serving under the Fourth Army, and achieved the first breakthrough during Case Red, uh, they were also the first to reach and cross the Seine River. So, with a new plan in place, the push into the lowlands began on May 10th of 1940. Army Group B swept into the Netherlands and Belgium through and through st strategic use of airborne troops seized key sites, forcing the Dutch to surrender after five days and the Belgians to fall back to await French and British reinforcements. Meanwhile, three panzer divisions, led by Generals Guter Iren, Guter, oh, forgive my pronunciations, I'm totally going to butcher them, uh, Reinhardt and Hoff, are pushing through the Ardennes, emerging on May 13th to plow through French defenses on the Meuse River. Ten days after opening uh, the offensive, the Panzer Corps reached the English Channel at Aperville, establishing a Panzer Corridor dividing the Allied forces in two. Now, as the Panzers advanced, advanced north, the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, fell back to Dunkirk to, to prep for evacuation. Between the evacuation of British forces and the surrender of Belgium on May 28th, France was left extremely vulnerable. On June 5th, the German army drove through French defenses and by June 14th marched victorious on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Now, an armistice was signed on June 25th with newly appointed French President Marshal Philippe Pétain. So, Basically, in six weeks, Hitler was able to comprehensively defeat the defeat France, Belgium, and the Netherlands while forcing the British to retreat back across the channel, leaving behind heavy weapons and equipment. Which was probably a major blow to their ego. Anyway, uh, the Ardennes also played a part in the Battle of the Bulge towards the end of the war during the Allied push into Germany. At this stage, the Allied forces viewed the Ardennes as a quiet zone, 
so the 88 mile stretch was held by four u.s infantry divisions the 99th the 106th the 28th and the 4th with the untested 9th armored division in reserve on december 16th german artillery hit the u.s line and broke communications while the 6th Panzer Division attacked in the north with the 5th Panzer and 7th Army. The 99th was able to hold ground for a while before the lack of communications between the 106th and the 14th Cavalry Group opened a gap allowing German troops to advance. Now, if the plan would have worked, the Germans would have been able to cut off supply lines by capturing Antwerp, forcing the Allies to retreat. This, however, did not occur. They were met by numerous roadblocks uh, all along the route which slowed them down tremendously so by January 3rd the Allied forces uh, first and third armies attacked and started closing off the German forces causing them to withdraw and by January 25th the bulge was gone and the front had been restored so moving on to the second uh, location that I wanted to talk about, which is Point du Hoc. Uh, this came into play during the D-Day landings in Normandy on the 5th and 6th of June 1944. Uh, it was located between the two landing beaches, Omaha and Utah, and was a promontory with a 100-foot cliff overlooking the English Channel. Now, the German army had fortified the area with casements and gun points, reinforcing a battery initially built in 1943 to house six CPF 155mm howitzers that had been taken from the French, and the area was occupied by the 2nd Battery of the German Army Coastal Artillery Regiment. Now, the Germans had started the fortifications in the spring of 1944 with enclosed concrete casements for the howitzers, and all but two were finished prior to the attack. They also included an observation bunker and mounts for 20mm flak 30 anti-aircraft guns. The location was bombed in April of 1944, forcing the Germans to relocate the howitzers to a position further from the coast. Uh, during the prep for Operation Overlord, it was determined that the point should be attacked by ground forces to prevent the Germans from using it as an observation point, and the 2nd and 5th Ranger battalions were assigned to the task. So the battle at the point had a fairly interesting progression. Starting June 6th at, I think it was 0630 or 0640, somewhere in there, or H hour, D, E, and F companies of the 2nd Ranger Battalion approached the coast. At 0705, tides and navigational errors forces the 5th Rangers and A and B companies of the 2nd Rangers into landing at Omaha Beach. At 0730, the rangers advance up the cliff and start engaging German troops, discovering that the casements were empty. At 0815, roughly 35 rangers achieve the secondary objective of building a roadblock to limit German access to the point. At 0900, six of the moved 155 millimeters were located and destroyed using thermite charges which are actually pretty cool to see in action, but something I don't have hands-on experience with, probably for good reasons. For the rest of the day, Rangers repel several German counterattacks, and during the evening, a small 23-person patrol from the Rangers on Omaha make it through the lines to support troops holding the point. On June 7th, Rangers continue to defend against counterattacks from the German uh, 914th Grenadier regiment, and finally on the morning of June 8th, with supplies dwindling, the rangers of Pointe du Hoc are relieved by the remainders of the 2nd and 5th rangers, accompanied by the 1st battalion of the 116th infantry and tanks from the 743rd tank battalion. The third and for now final location that I would like to talk about is Gibraltar. Now, Gibraltar was a major strategic point in World War II in regards to control of the Mediterranean and forces, and forces, forces stationed here were critical in stopping German naval reinforcements from reaching the fight in North Africa and in stopping the Italian naval forces from reaching the Atlantic. Now, as early as 1940, Germany had plans to take Gibraltar. However, due to 
the chaotic nature of the war, uh, Operation Felix, as it was called, never gained the necessary backing and was eventually canceled. Also, due to the positioning of Gibraltar, the German army would have had to move their heavy artillery through Spain. Now, Germany was unable to secure an agreement with the Spanish dictator uh, Francisco Franco because abandoning neutrality would have resulted in the loss of the Canary Islands and other Spanish territories to Britain. There is some historical backing to show that there was some interference by Hitler's envoy, uh, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, uh, head of the intelligence service, who may have in fact been running a secret resistance movement, and with Franco was intentionally specifying terms that they knew Hitler was certain to refuse. If the plan would have gone through, then the war in the Mediterranean and North Africa might have gone much differently, um, you know, particularly in regards to Rommel's tank forces, whom were limited by a lack of supplies and replacement parts for damaged vehicles. But the North Africa campaign is a whole story to itself. And that's not to say that Gibraltar avoided enemy attack. Uh, in 1940, after the French surrendered to Germany during the fall of France, the British launched an attack on the French fleet in Algeria, to which the French responded with an air raid on July 14, 1940. Uh, this air raid was largely unsuccessful, with most of the bombs falling short of actually damaging ships. A second, slightly more successful air raid occurred on September 24th in response to the British attack of the French fleet at Dakar. Now, not to be outdone, the Italians launched 14 air raids between the years of 1940 and 1943, and deployed numerous Navy frogmen raids, um, which by August uh, 1943 had successfully sunk 14 ships. Uh, Gibraltar also became the home port of Force H, a Royal Navy unit responsible for holding the Straits of Gibraltar and escorting convoys to allied, allied areas in the Mediterranean, which was especially important during the Siege of Malta. Force H was the main player in the hunting and sinking of the Bismarck, a German battleship. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gibraltar was also the staging point for Operation Torch, uh, the Adelaide, Allied landings in North Africa in November of 1942. But like I said, the North Africa campaign is a story all to itself. Um, after this, Gibraltar became more of just a resupply point. And yeah, it just kind of eventually faded out. Uh, they had evacuated all civilian, all of the civilians from the island, um, I think it was prior to 1940 or while they were still doing construction of the bases in 1940 and 1941. Uh, but people were eventually allowed to come back in, and that's pretty much the end of the story of Gibraltar in World War II. So, uh, yeah, you know, um, just uh, wanted to say thank you for to anybody who decided to stick around through my rambling. Um, yeah, if there are any other topics you want to hear me go on about, you know, feel free to make your suggestions in the comments below. Um, well, I do have a you know, very strong interest in history, military history in particular. Uh, my educational background is actually in biology, uh, or marine biology, uh, in particular marine biology. So, you know, if you have any topics in that area that you would want to hear me ramble on about for, I don't know, a few minutes, uh, you know, just uh, feel free to make your comments in the suggest. Uh, feel free to make your suggestions in the comments below. I can talk. Sorry, it's like four something in the morning. Um, and again, I wanted to say thank you for sticking around. I know that the audio quality isn't all that great. Just, you know, working with some cheap equipment that I use when playing multiplayer games. Um, I do believe that's everything for me. 
So on that note, Parasha Kitsune out.